Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to our last talk. Um, in the hot seat today is Mariano Zeron of Mocax Intelligence. And as you all know, the focus of his presentation is Chebyshev's tensors and machine learning in dim calculations. If you do have questions throughout the presentation, please direct them to me, the host. And uh, if you do that privately, then Mariano will cover those at the end. And now I'll hand over to Mariano and let him get things underway. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Bobby. Um, so yes, thank you very much for coming to this presentation. So as Bobby said, I'm Mariano Zoron. I'm the head of uh, Mocha uh, Research and Development at Mocha Intelligence. And today we're going to be covering church of tensors and machine learning as tools in order to compute dynamic initial margin. Let's uh, get started. Very Briefly, I'm just going to tell you who we are. Mocax Intelligence is a startup in the area of risk analytics. Uh, and basically what we do, which is a bunch of people who like coming up with technical solutions for, for well-defined business problems, this is very important. We, we are practitioners at the end of the day. We like the theory, uh, solid mathematical frameworks, but uh, ideally we want to be able to adjust these in order to be able to tackle the main problems that, uh, that we're interested in. And we love doing this in collaboration frameworks. So if anything that uh, what we say is relevant to you, Please get in contact with us. We love hearing about the problems that you have to solve on a regular basis, and we like doing that alongside with you. So we're really excited to have been considered one of the top three fintech startups in risk analytics in recent times. It was very, very encouraging. And before we jump into the content of this presentation, just one mention that I have to make is that the application of some of the methods presented here are pattern protected. But if you're interested in implementing them, please get in contact. We don't want this to be a, be a blocking point of any sort. We're more than happy to give you a license for your own use. Let's jump straight into the contents of uh, this presentation. First of all, we're going to be identifying what the main problem that we want to address is, and that is a pricing problem in risk calculations. Once we describe what this is, we're going to see specifically how this crystallizes in dynamic initial margin. And uh, after that, we're going to briefly mention some of the techniques that we're going to be uh, exploring to compute dynamic initial margin. And then we're going to go into a bit of a detour talking about Chebyshev tensors, which are the main mathematical objects that we research and we try and see how to apply to all sorts of risk calculations. We'll see how to apply them in risk engines. And finally, we'll uh, see how we can come up with dynamic initial margin calculations using uh, the techniques, the three main techniques that we're going to focusing on, which are two of them are from machine learning and the other one are uh, using Chebyshev tensors. Let's uh, first jump straight into the problem that we want to address, and this is the pricing problem in risk calculations. So in risk calculations, uh, what does it consist of? It's, very, it's a very uh, simple thing conceptually. So you first of all have to uh, come up with a collection of scenarios. Usually you've got a considerable number of scenarios, and each of these scenarios needs to be priced by your pricing routines. That is the pricing functions of your trades in your portfolio. And this step is the one which can be particularly expensive given the number of trades that you've got in portfolios and also because some of these pricing routines can be exp uh, expensive to run. So what are the orders of magnitude that we're talking about here? Let me give you a typical, a typical example, a CVA calculation on remote card simulation of which we're gonna be dealing with a lot in this presentation. Usually we uh, we're talking about 10,000 parts, 100 times steps into the future. This gives us a million nodes in the Monte Carlo in the Monte Carlo simulation. And if you have to call your pricing routines at each of these nodes, you're talking about uh, an order of magnitude of 10 to the six pricings that you have to do. And this is just one calculation of which there are many that you have to do on a regular basis, like sensitivities with respect to CBA or any XBA cal calculation would involve some similar kind of computation burden. Uh, for capital IMM CCR, something similar in a different, uh, on a different way, capital IMA FRTB also involves uh, evaluating many uh, risk scenarios. So it's the accumulation of all these risk calculations that poses the problem that we face today uh, when we talk about the pricing problem in risk calculations. And you can buy CPUs, but uh, in order to be able to uh, obtain these metrics uh, uh, in a daily manner, you have to buy thousands of CPUs, which in itself becomes problematic because you have to maintain them and you have to pay for uh, electricity usage and so on. So ideally, we would like to come up with approximation methods. And of course, in the industry, there's been a lot of these methods proposed recently. And two, of course, the main features that they need to have is that they need to be fast uh, so that we come up with the metrics um, in a timely manner. 
and they need to be accurate because otherwise we wouldn't be able to use these approximation methods to replace the calculations that we would obtain if we call that pricing functions. By the way, if you carry out one of these risk calculations with your pricing functions, this is what we call the brute force approach. Ideally, that's what we'd like to use if we had the computational power available to us. Unfortunately, we don't, so we have to resort to approximation methods. And of course, one very important aspect that I want to highlight, apart from being fast and accurate, is that they should be as easy as possible because implementation can be very cumbersome in, uh, for some, some of these approximation techniques. So we want them to be simple and, of course, stable so they can use them day in, day out. Ideally, they shouldn't be using a lot of memory. Now, in particular, the calculation that we're interested in is dynamic initial margin. So what are the computational requirements for dynamic initial margin? First of all, initial margin. There's many definitions of initial margin. It's a quantity that has become quite relevant with collateralization. We're going to be focusing on two of these definitions of initial margin. One of them is a VAR-like measure. Basically, it's a quantile that you compute on a distribution of P&Ls. The other one is the one proposed by ISTA a few years ago that we call SIM. And this is sensitivity-based. What does it mean? It means that for each trade, you've got a set of risk factors which are specified by ISDA. So it's completely they tell you exactly which ones to look at. You compute the sensitivities of each trade with respect to these uh, risk factors. Once you get the sensitivities, you just combine them, uh, aggregate, them, aggregate them in specific ways, and you obtain your initial margin. Now, given that initial margin has become very important in risk calculations, it's important to have an idea of how this evolves in the future. So this is when Monte Carlo simulations, where at each node of the simulation, you need to compute initial margin, becomes relevant. And this is a typical example of a nested Monte Carlo type of simulation, which is very expensive. For example, take a look here on the right hand side. You've got here one path of your Monte Carlo simulation. At some point, you get to this time point in the future. Let's say you take this node here. At that node, you need to compute initial margin. If it's through the quantile approach, the var like type of measure, then you need to have a whole PL distribution here for which then you compute the quantile, and that's the initial margin at that point. But you've got a million of these nodes. That becomes quite expensive. If it's through SIM, then you need to compute sensitivities at that node. And then with that, you can compute initial margin. So the costs that we're talking about here are of the order of 10 to the 8, so 100 times higher than a typical CPA calculation. And for SIM, it's 10 to the 7. So both of them quite, quite expensive. And what are the approaches that we're going to be looking in, into in order to try and alleviate this computational burden? So we're going to focus on three types, all of them sampling techniques. So we're talking about sampling techniques in the sense that, for example, if you want to approximate a function like the one that you've got here, you need to sample the function at particular points. And with that information, then you come up with some sort of approximation. So we're going to be looking into two of them, which are uh, that come under the hood of machine learning. One of them is well, just typical regression methods, which have been some of the techniques that have been considered from the beginning in order to approximate dynamic initial margin. Uh, most of the results, all the comments that we'll make about these uh, regressions come from the paper that Chan and his collaborators published in 2017. Uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, there's a slide with references where you can see the exact title and where to get the paper. Um, also, we're going to be uh, considering the uh, deep neural nets that have become quite popular in recent times. And uh, also, we're going to be talking about Chebyshev tensors and how to apply them in dynamic initial margin. Quick comments about each of each of them. Then in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to go into the details of each of them and also present results and so that we can come up with a comparison of the three methods. Very quickly, regression methods tend to approximate initial margin uh, through the VAR-like type of calculation, the one that considers PL distributions and um, the quantile. It makes a few set of assumptions so that we can use these regressions. Uh, normality of the PL distribution is one of them. Also, you need to have a PV distribution on, throughout the Monte Carlo simulation, which in itself is a computational cost. But of course, we like regressions because they're fast and ones that are trained, right? And very simple objects. And it's always a cost thing. Deep neural nets, um, they, the way that they've been implemented in this paper okay, from 2019, the paper that I quite liked, is uh, they try to approximate directly SIM, uh, powerful, as we know, deep neural nets, but they can be difficult to train. In particular, the hyperparameter optimization can become uh, problematic sometimes. Uh, again, the way that they uh, went about uh, implementing these deep neural nets requires the, P the distribution of PVs throughout the Monte Carlo uh, simulation. Finally, we get to Chebyshev tensors. Now, Chebyshev tensors, as well as the other two techniques, are sampling techniques. But one thing that distinguishes this technique 
is that it has to evaluate the function of very specific points. So that's what we call smart sampling. And the idea is that if you sample functions and specific points, then you get really good mathematical results in terms of convergence towards the function. I'll go into the details of that uh, in due course. I'll explain all about that, but this is something important to bear in mind. Also, Chebyshev uh, tensors can be applied in different ways. And in particular here, they're applied trying to, uh, with the object, objective or the aim of approximating sensitivities, the sensitivities which are later on used in order to compute SIM. The computational burden is actually quite low compared to the other ones, it's 10 to the 4. And just as a side comment, given that you obtain sensitivities, they can be used for other stuff like dynamic hedging and so on. I'm not going to go into that topic, but it's always important to bear in mind that whatever you obtain and some processes that you run, you can always reuse for other purposes. Great, so we'll come back to these three, three techniques uh, later on. But right now, I want to go through the mathematical properties of Chebyshev tensors, which are the objects that we uh, like using uh, for accelerating risk calculations. I'm going to start from the very basics, but quickly get to uh, the point, uh, quickly get to the point where we can present the main results of Chebyshev tensors. First of all, I'm going to introduce what a tensor is. And a tensor is just a grid of points with values on those points. So something as simple as what you see here on the right-hand side. Associated to tensors, we have polynomial interpolants. Now, how do we come up with a polynomial interpolant from a tensor? Take, for example, the very, a very simple example of a tensor in one dimension. You've got grid points here. Then assume that you've got values associated to these grid points. Now, I'm not gonna go into the uh, justification, the mathematical justification of this, but we know that there is a unique polynomial of a specific degree goes through these values. So every time that we think of a tensor, think also of its associated polynomial interpolant. Now, why do we care about these objects? The reason why we care about these objects is because we want to approximate functions. If you start with this kind of function, let's say one dimensional function, very easy to come up with an associated tensor, define the, the grid of points below here, any points, evaluate the function, that gives you these red stars, and from that, you can compute the associated interpolant. Now, the idea is that as you refine the grid of points, then you get a sequence of polynomials. And the question is, can we use these polynomials in, in order to get closer and closer to the function? Unfortunately, everything is not as simple as it sounds, as tends to often be the case in mathematics. For example, at the beginning of the 20th century, Runge came up with a function, very well behave, behaved function, nowadays known as the Runge function, that is analytic, very smooth, but he considered equidistant points for tensors and the corresponding interpolants, and he noticed that as you refine the grid of points, you actually get divergence, exponential divergence away from the function, which is the opposite kind of behavior to the one that he would like to have. At the same time, Faber proved that for the set of continuous functions or the class of continuous functions, there's no interpolation scheme that works for them, generically speaking. So on the face of it, polynomial interpolation doesn't work that well. But something that has often been missed is that if you restrict the change or impose two conditions, then the picture completely changes. One of them is that the grid points always have to be distributed according to Chebyshev points. Chebyshev points are the following thing. Let's use this diagram here at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. If you take the interval minus one to one, and you take the upper half of the same circle and take equidistant points on that same circle, and then project the points, you end up with points which tend to be agglomerated towards the endpoints. Those are the Chebyshev points. Very easy to define, completely prescriptive. You've got formulas here which are very easy to implement on a computer. That's the first condition. The second is that we have to restrict ourselves to analytic functions in order to get really powerful results. You can also have other results for more general functions, but we like uh, restricting ourselves to analytic functions. And with those two conditions, we obtain the following theorem, which is central. This is the combination of many results obtained throughout the 20th century and some very recent ones, uh, even in 2016. And it says that if you've got an analytic function, let's say f of any dimension, then the Chebyshev interpolant or the Chebyshev tensors of degree n converges quasi exponentially to the function f as n tends to infinity. If it's one dimensional, by the way, you get exponential convergence. n is the degree of the interpolant, which is directly related to the number of points on the tensor. This is very important because remember how we obtained a tensor for a given function. You get the grid points, which in this case are distributed according to Chebyshev, and then you evaluate the function on those points. So what this theorem says is that in order to obtain a very high degree of accuracy, 
only need to evaluate the function on very few points. Now, let me show you an example of how important it is to choose the points on the grid that define the tensor in this specific way. Consider a spot volt surface. What we did is we considered Chebyshev grids and built the tensors associated to it in order to try and approximate the spot, uh, spot volt surface. And we also defined equidistant grids. In both cases, always measuring the error that they made with respect to the surface. And what we did is we started refining the number of points on the grid. So here on the x-axis, you see we've got number of points. So here, 100 points on the tensor, 200 points on the tensor, 300 points on the tensor, and so on. In each case, we measured the error as the maximum error. On the y-axis, you've got this error in log scale. This is very important. The results for the Chebyshev grid are shown in this red decaying line, which decays exponentially. The blue one is for the equidistant points. And look at the difference. Notice again that it's a log scale. So the difference is actually huge. For 250 points, for example, the Chebyshev grid achieved an error of 10 to the minus 7. For the equidistant grid, it only obtained 10 to the minus 1. In order to get 10 to the minus 1, in this case, the Chebyshev grid would have consisted of only 10 to 20 points. Remember that what we're trying to solve here is the pricing problem in risk calculations. Avoiding having to call the pricing function is key. It's crucial. So these kind of Chebyshev grids give us that advantage. Now, all this is mathematics on paper. Great. So far, we've got really good convergence properties. No problem. But we want to be able to evaluate these tensors. And the optimal way of evaluating these tensors comes in the form of the barycentric interpolation formula that you can see in the middle of your screen. This is the one dimensional version, it can be extended to high dimensions, relatively straightforward, and it's got three important properties. The first one is that it's numerically stable. This is very important, and we often, often forget how important this is. A lot of algorithms, um, unfortunately, accumulate the rounding off errors that computers always make, giving you at the end a result that is completely different to the one that you should obtain, at least on paper. So, and in fact, I mean, I've even seen in Python and in MATLAB a lot of algorithms which are implemented that are numerically unstable. A lot of times, if, let's say this n with respect to which you normally measure this um, instability, if it's not that big, you're fine. But if it starts increasing, you have no control over it. So it's always important to be on the safe side. And the barycentric, barycentric interpolation formula guarantees numerical stability. So it's very important. Also, it's super fast. It evaluates in linear time with respect to n which, as I said, is directly related to the number of times that you evaluate the function. So exponential convergence tells you you don't have to evaluate the function that many times to get high accuracy. Linear time with respect to the number of times that you evaluate the function means you're evaluating this object super quickly. And finally, look at the expression. The expression only consists of the Chebyshev points here, xi, and f of xi, which is the value of the function on the Chebyshev points. There's nothing associated uh, to the interpolant so what this means is that this formula only needs the information at the level of the tensor in order to be able to evaluate the whole polynomial, which is good because once you obtain the tensor, that's all you need. You can then run the barycentric interpolation formula in order to get the results that you need. Now, all this wouldn't be of any use if we couldn't apply it for pricing functions. But pricing functions tend to be quite smooth, as we know. As we know. There are exceptional points like when there's payment dates, barriers, strikes, and so on, but we know where they are. So we can always split the function into chunks which have uh, good properties like being analytic and apply these uh, Chebyshev tensors. And hence, it's uh, from all this information, it makes uh, for an obvious case to test these tensors with pricing functions, especially when, to, when you want to alleviate the burden of calling them over and over again, as is typically the case in uh, risk calculations. Now, just a quick summary of what we've seen, the theory behind Chebyshev uh, Tensors. We've got exponential convergence, which means high levels of accuracy with a few calls to the pricing function. Also, barycentric interpolation formula evaluates that uh, interpolant super fast and great that it applies to pricing functions, at least most pricing functions. By the way, the uh, wealth of research behind Chebyshev uh, interpolants um, is out there for people to read. This is just a collage of some of the references that we found quite useful. In the middle, for example, we've got this textbook, which is uh, pretty good, written by Professor Trefevin in from Oxford University. Uh, it's very theoretical. It doesn't uh, use, uh, it doesn't mention any applications outside of its immediate scope. And most of the research in the 20th century was basically restricted to that. But more recently, there's been applications outside of uh, just of its immediate scope and uh, 
just like ask other people in recent years have been investigating how to use these Chebyshev tensors in finance in particular. But get in contact with us if you want more references, we're more than happy to give you, give you these references. And at the end of the presentation, there's a whole slide with um, references. Now let's jump to a brief description of how you can use Chebyshev tensors within risk engines. And for that, first of all, I'm going to mention how a typical risk calculation uh, takes place. So for example, take the risk scenarios that you need to prepare. It doesn't really matter how you obtain them. Let's say that you've already got them. 5,000 scenarios, just as an example. These 5,000 scenarios get passed to the pricing engine where they get priced. That's the particularly difficult step that we identify. That's what it's possibly to run. Then you obtain these, the price distribution, which would be a, another 5,000 of these prices. And then from that price distribution, you can come up with the metrics that you need. It could be EVA values or capital values. Now, given this picture, how can we incorporate tensors, Chebyshev tensors, in order to alleviate the cost of calling pricing functions on 5,000 scenarios? First of all, you start with 5,000 scenarios, as you did before. And what we want is to build Chebyshev tensors. For that, we need the grid points that we need, are, we know are distributed according to Chebyshev, and then we call the functions to be approximated on those grid points. But the key step is how we can come up with each Chebyshev scenarios given these 5,000 scenarios. And that's something that I will address in a couple of slides. First, let's assume that we've already done that step and that we ended up with 100 Chebyshev scenarios, grid points. These then get priced. That gives you the Chebyshev tensor. The Chebyshev tensor, remember that we've got the Parasang triggered interpolation formula so that we can prize the original 5,000 scenarios that we've got there with the tensor, which takes no time at all, gives you the price distribution, and the subsequent risk metrics, just as you calculate them before. The key thing here is that we went from 5,000 scenarios that you would have had to evaluate with your pricing routines in the brute force approach to only evaluating the grid points of the Chebyshev tensor, which in this case were 100. So basically, we've saved ourselves 4,900 evaluations, and that's where the time savings come in. So, in order to see how we do this step, First of all, we need to address the following issue that we encounter with tensors in general, and that is the curse of dimensionality. What does this say? It says that as the dimension of the tensor increases, the number of points on the grid floats exponentially. Why is this a problem for us? Well, pricing functions are high dimensional. For example, a Bermuda option depends on tens of interest rates, let's say 50 of them, and hundreds of implied volatility. So we're talking about a function which is in hundreds in terms of dimensions, so it's impossible to bid, build a tensor for them. Just a tensor of 100 dimensions, so two points per dimension, gives us 1.2 times 10 to the 30 grid points, so it's impossible to build a tensor for. The question is, how do we sidestep this problem? And we've got three ways of sidestepping this problem. All of them apply to how we build, how we go from risk scenarios to generating the grid points of a tensor. First of these techniques is what we call the composition technique, which is hugely relevant to the calculation of dynamic initial margin with Chebyshev tensors, which is what we are interested in. This covers uh, the low dimensional range. I'll explain what that means. Then we've got the completion algorithm, which covers a higher range of dimensionality, let's say up to 30. The very recent technique came up earlier this year. Pretty exciting, actually. I've been working on it for a while and uh, for the last couple of months and it's been uh, getting really good results, but still more has to be done. And it has some machine learning elements incorporated in it. And finally, the sliding technique that usually gets applied in things like FRTV and covers really high dimensions. So let's go into each one of them quickly just to see what, uh, what they entail. In particular, this is very important for us. So in, within a Monte Carlo simulation, what you normally do is diffuse, diffuse risk factor scenarios into the future. So you'll have yield curves, spread curves, spread curves, and involved surfaces, for example, at each node of a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, of course, the ones that generate these, usually you pass them through the pricing function, which, can be, which is highly dimensional, in order to return the price distribution, which is what you need. Now, how do we generate these yield curves, for example? We usually use models that tend to have very few degrees of freedom. For example, a Holland White model tends to have one, two, or three short rates, volatility, stochastic volatility models also rely on very few factors, also regressive models, for example, do the same. So we take advantage of the fact that we start off with a, let's say, model space, which in the case of Paul White would be the space spanned by these short rates, which have low dimensionality. And what we do is we take this function G, comes in the model, and we compose it 
with a pricing function p. So basically, what we've created here is a function f that goes from r k, where k is low dimensional, let's say from one to five, and returns the price. We can call this, or we can think of f as being a pricing function, not in terms of the market space, but in terms of the model space. And this is very important because for that f, we can actually build championship tensors, so it's very good. Now we go to the completion algorithm. So as I said, very uh, cool technique that came up earlier this year by Catherine Glau and her collaborators. So it basically consists of the following. Let's say that you've got a 20-dimensional tensor for which you want to build a so a 20-dimensional tensor. So you can't build it, you can't be calling your pricing function on each grid point. So you can so you can call it on let's say 5% of those points. So they keep that information aside. And what they do then is focus on a subspace of tensors. These are tensors, uh, when we speak in the T, uh, they're expressed in TT format and have low rank. But what that means is that they're compressible in the sense that you can save them in memory and you can operate with them even, they, even though they have 20 dimensions. Of course, not all tensors have that property. It's only a, uh, only a collection of them. But restricting itself over this space, they run an optimization algorithm uh, with the aim of finding a compressible tensor that approximates the tensor that you want to obtain, at least on those um, the 5% of the points that you managed to evaluate. The, one of the reasons why this works or has worked so far really well is because functions behave uh, in, fi in finance behave really well. Of course, this wouldn't work for any just random, random function. It still needs to be explored, but so far the results that these guys obtained and the ones that I've obtained have been uh, really, really good. And it's a good way of trying to extend the dimensionality of uh, the tensors. And finally, the sliding technique, which covers really high dimensionality cases usually applied in situations like FRTV, for example, uh, consists of the following. We, we can't take advantage here of the fact that risk factors are generated through a uh, low dimensional model, like in Monte Carlo simulations. These are just given to you the risk factors. They're usually historically collected and they could be in the hundreds. But one, they enjoy high degrees of correlation. So you can group them appropriately and apply some dimensionality reduction techniques such as PCA. Don't reduce it all the way down to three or five. You can, Still keep quite a lot of degrees of freedom or a principal component, let's say 30, 50. Once you've reduced it down to that, you still need to build a tensor. How do you do it? Well, instead of building a whole tensor, like for example, what we'd have here, what you have here on the left hand side for three dimensions, of course, for three dimensions, you can get away with just one tensor. But let's assume that that was 50 dimensions. Instead of building a single tensor, what do you do is just group the principal components whichever way you want. Usually, the best practice is to group the first ones together, let's say the first and the second build the tensor for that, and then the third one separate, build another tensor for that, and then you have to put them together somehow. I'm not going to go into the details of how this is done, but you can do it, put it together to evaluate the whole tensor. And it gives you really, really good results. But you can also do each principal component separate. And the interesting thing is that you sidestep the curse of dimensionality because you go from, let's say, 64 points in this very simple case down to 12 points, but something similar happens when you're in 50 dimensions. And uh, I mean, we've, we've tested this in particular, this technique, uh, the case of FRTB IMA, capital calculation, the results have been actually really good. We recommend that you that, we, that you read a paper that we just put up an archive, uh, and SSRN, where we describe how this technique works. It's, it's really good for these particular kind of cases. So now, before we go into the calculation of dynamic and uh, initial margin, let me just quickly give you an overview of the kind of things that we've been able to tackle with Chebyshev tensors. So for example, which business lines have we identified and have we applied with success? So market, risk uh, market risk capital, so FRTV IMA, for example, XVA pricing, um, such the calculation, for example, of expected exposures or profiles and so on, XVA hedging, dynamic initial margin, CCR capital, CVA FRTV, and so on. And in every single one of the cases, we usually see computation savings, which are uh, considerable in the 90% plus range. In some cases, like dynamic initial margin, as we'll see later on, even 99% compared to brute force. I mean, this means basically that for every one hour of brute force pricing, you reduce the calculation to just a handful of minutes. Bear in mind that these minutes are the, uh, this is the time that it takes you to build the Chevy chip tensor because once you build it, evaluating it literally takes no time due to the barycentric interpolation formula, which is the kind of thing that we would expect. Even for other approximation techniques, Usually, once you've got the object, if it's a simple object like regressions and micro things, those things get evaluated in no time, which is the case as well with, with Chebyshev sensors. So really good uh, results we've been able to see with these 
uh, championship sensors. And now we're going to go into the calculation that we mentioned from the beginning, which is dynamic initial margin. We mentioned at the beginning three uh, different techniques that we're going to describe. One of them is just uh, regressions, actually quite typical, traditional, simple, straightforward regressions. But these are uh, being proposed by many people in the industry. It makes sense that they were the first things to try. Then we're going to go into deep neural nets and then into Chebyshev sensors. Let's start with uh, regressions. First of all, the comments on the results that we show in uh, these slides come from this paper by Chan and his collaborators from 2017. Of course, there's many other papers that have also tried to use regressions of all sorts in order to compute dynamic initial margin. But in this particular case, they're approximating a VAR-like type of initial margin. And what is it that we want if we were to compute a brute force? Well, we need to compute a quantile on a PL distribution at every node of the Moscow simulation. That has a cost of 10 to the 8, which is humongous. So you run some tests on a portfolio of 100 trades, consisting of swaps, swaptions, and cross currency swaps. They considered polynomial regression and also a really interesting type of non parametric regression, which is called Nadaraya Watson, which is quite flexible and has some nice properties. Now, in order to be able to run it, unfortunately, you rely on having a distribution of PVs at each node of the simulation. In fact, at each node of the simulation and also 10 days ahead of each node of the simulation. So basically, if you were considering the typical Monte Carlo simulation that we've been considering so far, of 1 million nodes, you would need 2 million evaluations. So we're talking about an order of magnitude of 10 to the 6. If you've got it, great. Otherwise, you need to produce it, which is, I would say, one of the downsides. One of the main assumptions that you need to make is that the distribution of PLs is normal. Once you make that assumption, then these formulas below, I'm not going to go into, into them, give you how to compute initial margin. In fact, they tell you how to compute any quantile for the PNL distribution. But of course, this assumption, the fact that you've got normality in the PNL distribution, is, I would say, uh, somewhat of a strong uh, assumption. And of course, it comes at a cost, right? So let's see the results that they uh, showed in terms of accuracy. What they ran were a few uh, statistical tests to see whether there was any consistency throughout the Monte Carlo simulation as they uh, dynamically simulated initial margin. They, were, they, they saw that, generally speaking, the simulation behaved better at the beginning of the simulation, let's say in the first few time, uh, time points, but deteriorated uh, longer, at longer maturities, which is something that tends to happen. So in, in terms of accuracy, some good results, some not so good results. And bear in mind that this was the, a VAR-like type of initial margin. Then comes the computational cost. So uh, it assumes having a distribution of PVs throughout the Monte Carlo simulation. So it's something close to 10 to the 6 requirement. Of course, this can always be thinned down, but still you have a pretty heavy burden that you that you incur in. But once that's done, it's a very fast evaluation. As we know, uh, regressions are very fast to run and actually relatively simple, simple to train, given that they tend to have analytic solutions. And um, the drawbacks. So uh, one thing which is not uh, great is if you want to use them to simulate uh, SIM, um, you're not going to get very good results. The reason being that these simulate a uh, far like type of uh, initial margin. Now, a lot of people, given that SIM has become the standard in the, in the industry, a lot of people have been suggesting how to adapt this kind of calculation to SIM. And one of the things that people tend to use is just to shift the uh, profiles of margin so that, for example, uh, today's value of SIM coincides with today's uh, value of initial margin calculated through a quantile. But of course, this doesn't always give you very good results and it's frowned upon by regulators. So it's uh, definitely something that you should avoid unless you have to necessarily use this kind of technique in order to approximate, uh, in order to come up with an estimate for these kind of profiles. So I would say that's definitely one of the major drawbacks that it has. Okay, this is, was the regression. As I said, uh, there's many people that have been using them in different ways, so you'll be able to find quite a lot of literature around them. Uh, but I think we can do better. And uh, for example, there's been this technique that was suggested uh, this year. Of course, deep neural nets, a lot of people know who, what they are. They've been used in other industries and even in this industry already for a few years. This paper came up only this year. Uh, it's a paper that I particularly liked. What it does is actually simulate SIM dynamically. With brute force approach, it would take it's something of the order of 10 to the 7. Now, what do they test it on? They tested it on a portfolio of swaps and cross currency swaps, which is mainly a linear portfolio. Um, it's affected by about 60 uh, dimensions, basically the input layer of the input layer of the 
um, you know, deep neural net is over 60 dimensions. The deep neural net that they actually ended up using is a very simple one, very similar to the one that you see here on your screen. This one has two hidden layers. They actually ended up using three hidden layers, which is actually quite straightforward, nothing really, really fancy, which is a good thing. Because even though they've got this flexibility that you can increase the complexity in a deep neural net, whichever way you want, that gives you certain flexibility, but at the same time, that imposes certain restrictions, especially when it comes to hyperparameter optimization, which is one of the main challenges when one uses machine learning algorithms. In each of the hidden layers, you've got four to eight neurons. So again, not terrible. And one really good thing uh, about what their approach is that they used the simulated risk factors as inputs that you obtain from a typical CCR engine. So basically they're assuming that you already start with an engine, which would be the case for many people out there in banks. And it's basically, okay, what do we have? These kind of risk factors, stick to those risk factors, use them as inputs, and also add on top of that the time variable, which is very simple. You get it straight away from a Monte Carlo simulation. And the cost comes in when you incorporate the distribution of PVs. And they did this in order to get better results, of course. But obtaining PVs at each node of the Monte Carlo simulation already imposes some computation. But, and the output was simple, basically. They used uh, not many training dump, uh, uh, not many training points, so only between 100 and 5,000 data samples, which is actually not that uh, great for deep neural nets. So that's not bad. Um, and let me show you the results that they obtained. So first of all, computational costs. As I said, they incorporate PVs of the Monte Carlo simulation, which uh, takes 10 to the six, um, which is already something. The pricing for, uh, for obtaining the data samples was only of 10 to the three, which pales in comparison to the 10 to the six that you already have there. That's not bad. Once you've got this, uh, this information, they trained the deep neural net only with 3000 epochs, which is uh, not uh, humongous. So the training takes uh, place in very little time. And the reported accuracy that they give is of between one to 4%, which is not bad. Now notice one thing, this is the mean absolute percentage error. This is the loss function that was used for training and hence that's why they report the accuracy with this metric. Now, usually we prefer to report the accuracy in terms of the maximum error. We would expect the maximum error to be higher than this 4%, definitely. Um, take a look at the right-hand side. This is a plot that appears in that paper uh, for a deep neural network trained on 100 scenarios. And what they did was compute the profiles of uh, initial margin, of dynamic initial margin. They computed the fifth quantile, the 50th quantile, and the 95th quantile, both brute force and with a DNN. And you can see they basically follow the same sort of um, pattern. So they're not, they're not bad. I mean, you can definitely see some difference here opening up, but overall I think is quite reasonable. And one thing that they explored, which is uh, pretty, pretty good, is the possibility of reusing the trained DNN for a whole quarter. And if you use uh, that for the whole quarter, of course, if you're able to train it and use it well throughout the whole time, that is amazing. But of course, when they uh, carried out the simulation for the whole quarter with a dynamic portfolio, of course, these tend to have uh, deter deterioration on the performance, especially as time goes by. And they try to adjust using, again, shiftings of the curves and so on, which is not ideal. But at least what you have here, this snapshot of the day, is not bad. Now, of course, the question would be, if you had a simple portfolio, what would happen if you increase the complexity of that portfolio, if you, increase, if you introduce, for example, permutative options, increase the dimensionality of the input, then you get into a situation where you have to play a bit more with the architecture of a deep neural net, and that's when things can become a bit problematic. Okay, fine. So these are the two first techniques from machine learning that I've presented, that we've spoken about. Now comes uh, Chebyshev tensors. Now, Remember, we're going to be using something very similar to the composition technique that I mentioned before. Um, take a look at this Monte Carlo simulation that we've got on our screens. What I'm going to describe is how to build the change of tensors in order to approximate the sensitivities of trades. And I'm going to focus on only one time slice, and it's going to be this time slice in the middle. And also, I'm going to just focus on how we build the change of tensor for one particular risk factor. And as an example, I'm going to choose a swap. That's just a simple trade. This would, all, everything that I say would equally apply to any other trade type. So stick to just one swap and stick to just one risk factor with respect to which we need to compute the sensitivity at each node of this time slice. And just uh, as an example, we're gonna take the one year swap rate. By the way, is this specifies which, which are the, the risk factors with respect to which you need to compute sensitivity. So just take a swap, one year, one year swap rate. 
footprint. So basically, what we're going to do is, given that this Monte Carlo simulation will be simulating these uh, one year swap rates, for that time slice in particular, you can always identify which is the maximum and the minimum value of that one year swap rate. And that gives you an interval. And we know the change of points are determined uh, automatically. There's a formula that tells you exactly where they are. So these are the red dots. And that's just half of the information that we need for a tensor. The other bit of information is the value on those grid points. What are the values that we need? Well, what we want to be able to obtain for each of these points is the value of the sensitivity of the swap with respect to the one year swap rate at those points. That's what we need. Once we have that, we've got a tensor, change of tensor, that we can then evaluate on every node of the Monte Carlo simulation. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so take this image here on the right hand side. We've already zoomed in to the time slice in question. Now I'm going to repeat what I said before, just for reinforcement purposes. What do we first do? Run the risk factor evolution model. Let's say a whole wide model, but it doesn't really matter which one it is. We've got 10,000 parts, 100 time steps into the future. Uh, we're going to have 10,000 of these nodes in this time slice, because that's the number of nodes we have in each time slice. Now, at each of these nodes, you're going to have a whole yield curve. In particular, you're going to have the distribution of one year swap rates. Uh, one year swap rate being one of the risk factors that is to specifies. Right. Then what do we do? As I said before, we obtain the maximum, the minimum, for the Chevy Chef points along that interval. They don't need to be part of Monte Carlo simulation, by the way. They're, they're highly likely they're not going to be. Uh, but then what you need to do, and this is crucial, is you need to compute the sensitivity on each of these Chevy Chef points, the sensitivity of the trade, in this case, the swap, with respect to the one year swap rate. This builds the tensor. And once you build the tensor, then you can evaluate the tensor on every node of your simulation obtaining the distribution of sensitivities of the swap with respect to the one year swap rate. Now, if you repeat this, for every risk factor and every time slice, you get all the information that you need in order to compute SIM at each node of the simulation. Now, what we're gonna do is look at this, how to compute the sensitivity on each of these Chevy Chef nodes. That's the important step to follow. So what is it that we need to do? We start from SI. SI is the sensitivity of the swap with respect to the swap rate. This is this kind of function, which is a high dimensional function. It goes from Rn to R. And then what we're going to do is we need to define an embedding, H, that is going to go from R to Rn. Or depending on how you define it, you can go from Rk to Rn, but K is going to be low dimensional. Let me just quickly go back to the composition technique that I mentioned before, because this completely relates to one of the ways that we apply chip chip techniques. Here, the composition technique, remember, we were interested in P, a pricing function. Now we've got SI, which is the sensitivity with respect to the, to the trade. Um, here, we were using this G function that comes from the risk factor diffusion model. It goes from RK to RN, this RN is high dimensional, the market space. And then you compose with the P to go to R, you end up with a low dimensional function, F. We're doing something essentially the same over here. We started with SI. Then we define an embedding H. The H could be this function G from your risk, risk factor diffusion model. And then you take the composition in order to define this F, for which you build the check tensor. But you can also define H. And in fact, this is what we did uh, in order to obtain the results that I'm going to show you in a second, which is just one dimensional. And it's completely agnostic to the risk factor diffusion model that's used. Of course, it comes with a bit of uh, loss in accuracy, but not significant. And I'm not going to go into the details of how you define this H, which is agnostic to the risk factor diffusion model. Uh, it's definitely not something for this uh, presentation like this, but we definitely encourage you to read one of the papers that we have where we describe how to do it. But ultimately, once you come up with this H, and by the way, there's, I'm sure there's many other ways of defining this embedding, you take the composition with this I, and then you come up with this function, which you can build the church of tensor for. In fact, this R1 here, maybe it's an abuse of notation because Essentially, it's an interval given by the maximum and the minimum of the one year swap rate. Chevy Chef points, these ones, would be in this interval here. And then what you need to do is take the composition of H followed by SI in order to obtain the values on those points and then get the tensor to then be able to evaluate it on all the nodes of the Monte Carlo simulation. So that's basically what we did. And let me now show you the results that we obtained. So the tests, or quick description of the, what we actually tested. 
So what do we want? We said sensitivities at each node. Brute force takes f of 10 to the 7. So what do we chose? We chose swaps, typical sort of starting example. But we also tested it on swaps with short maturity so that we can start getting some of the convexity on uh, some of the curvature on the, on the, on the function. And also we took swaps with different moneyness because we want to see whether or not there was any change depending on whether it was at the money, outside of the money, or in the money. What is the dimensionality? So we chose a stochastic uh, diffusion model for rates of one factor and one factor for volts, but this is, um, I mean, this doesn't really affect things. The important thing to notice is that we do have a full dimensionality of the market space, which can be in the hundreds, especially for something like a Bermudian swaption. And uh, the way that we had handled this uh, high dimensionality, of course, I'm sure that it's clear by now, is through this composition technique uh, in order to avoid having to build tensors in high dimensions. Let me show you the results now. First of all, let's focus on the left-hand side because this is where we summarize the computational effort required in the test and also the error that we obtained for the profiles of dy dynamic sim that we computed with respect to the benchmark, which was obtained through brute force. So how many Chebyshev points did we obtain uh, that we use per tensor? We were using roughly 10. Now, how many sensitivities? Remember that I explained to you how to obtain it for the one year swap rate, and we have to do it for every sensitivity. Is the prescribed term, depend, depending on the trade type, you can have between 10 and 30, roughly speaking. If we assume a standard Monte Carlo simulation with 100 time slices, we end up with a total computational burden of 10 to 4, which is orders of magnitude below what I've mentioned before. And the error that we obtained, well, for all the profiles that we computed, it was less than 1%. In fact, it was less than 1% or something like that. It's really, really high accuracy. And it comes, of course, from the properties that I mentioned before about temperature tensors. Now, on the right-hand side, you'll see some plots. The top row basically shows the expected um, profile, the expected exposure profile of initial margin. So the blue dots would be the ones computed with uh, the brute force approach, which of course takes ages. The bottom row is the 95th quantile. And we actually computed the, uh, these same profiles using two things. We actually implemented the regression methods that we mentioned before. First of all, because it's very simple to implement. Also, we want to get an idea of exactly what are the kind of results that one obtains. Nothing like actually testing things for yourself. And uh, we were able to see that when we got these results, this is for the Nadaraya Watson and this is for the polynomial regression. One note that we also make here, of course, is that these estimate the VAR-like type of initial margin, which is not SIM. These are SIM, this is the VAR-like type. So of course, they're not, they're not necessarily going to be matching one another. So that's why people apply this shifting factor. So you shift this down to here with it in the hope that the rest of the profile also matches. And in some cases, you're going to get good results. In other cases, you won't, for example, here, match this to that, and still you're going to get a big difference here. So you don't have that much control over the results that you obtain. Of course, you don't have anything else, and maybe this is what you'd use. But for example, with Chevy Chip, you matched it uh, near perfection, so much better, in my opinion. And this is for a swap chain, which is uh, out of the money. Uh, for the other, uh, swap shins uh, in the money. Again, similar, similar computational burden and similar kind of error. Really good, really good. And for at the money, really good, really good. So basically, it didn't really affect whether it was short maturity and the moneyness. The swap shin didn't really play a role. I'm not going to show the results on the swaps. They were way better. So we were more focusing on what the challenges would be when we tackle the like swap shin, for example. Now, what, is, what I showed you before, so these plots here, these are the profiles of initial margin, right? So you, they don't tell you exactly how the whole distribution of initial margins uh, looks like on a time slice. So this is what we did in order to show it for one particular time slice. So what we have here is in brute force, these are the blue dots, that's the benchmarks. So you can see them here, the histogram of the whole distribution of initial margins. The Chebyshev approach gave the same kind of profile, or the same kind of distribution for that time slice. And the regressions uh, didn't really do a very good job. Uh, but you can see that the approximation that we obtained at a high degree of accuracy for the profiles of initial margin really comes from the fact that we are approximating sensitivities to a high degree of accuracy. And as, as a result of that, high accuracy at the level of IM distribution. And as a result of that, high accuracy at the level of IM profiles. So that was uh, mainly uh, to do with the accuracy of the technique. And of course, I've been mentioning the computing effort of each of these techniques, but now I, I would put the, this table together to be able to compare them directly. So on the left-hand side, we've got a typical CBA calculation, right? Like we said at the beginning, we were going to consider a typical Monte Carlo simulation with 10 to the 6 nodes, 
And uh, how does brute force to dynamic initial margin compare to that? Usually you incur in about 10 times or 50 times greater effort, which is something of the order of 10 to the 7. So quite expensive, at least for dynamic sim. Uh, it will be 10 to the 8 for the other one. What happens with regressions? Well, regressions do reduce it from 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 6, which is something. Still, you've got this effort. Deep neural nets, again, 10 to the 6. Chevich of 1 actually reduced it considerably in our case to 10 to the 4. So huge computational savings. Now, here we've added KAD. So far, I haven't mentioned it. I want to keep the presentation focused on uh, only certain approaches, which were regression or two machine learning ones, regression and deep neural nets, and also Chevich. Uh, AED, of course, we all know that it's a very um, well known uh, type of uh, technique, especially really good at approximating sensitivity. The degree of accuracy is phenomenal, for sure, given the nature of it mathematically. But it comes with a, it has one big problem, in my opinion, and that's that it's very difficult to implement, especially in existing risk engines. I didn't want to go into the details of AAD or what are the results that have been obtained so far and so on. Generally speaking, in terms of computational demand, they tend to take about five to 10 times more than a CVA calculation, but of course, they give you a lot of information, which is a good thing. Um, so it's computational effort, somewhat uh, expensive, but the accuracy is, of course, phenomenal. But the big problem that it has, in my opinion, is that it's very complicated to implement. And simplicity should be valued massively, especially for the practitioner. So I would say that that's definitely one of the key properties that all these three techniques have regression, DNN, and, and Chebyshev. Good. So now that we've seen these three techniques, I just want to quickly summarize what we've seen in the second half of the presentation. Um, with regressions, DBL nets, and Chebyshev. So basically highlighting some sort of its strengths and some of the weaknesses, or still things that need to be done, right? So we know that regressions have, they're very simple, fast, and easy to implement. We should never discard these properties as being secondary. They're important. Uh, unfortunately, regressions, they're not complex enough uh, in order to be able to capture the complexities of a simulation such as SIM. So that is one of the problems. In order to be able to apply them, of course, there's certain assumptions that are made, and that comes at a cost, as I mentioned before. And also, you need to have anyway a whole distribution to I'll put that as a negative as well. Deep neural nets. Well, deep neural nets are regressions as well, but more complex ones. So this is good because they can tackle more difficult problems. In particular, they can tackle high dimensionality. They are fast, of course, once trained. And they could possibly be reused once they're trained in future instances, which is something that the paper also covered. Uh, main question that I would have is what would happen if we incorporate more complex traits? The dimension line to increase in particular, what would happen if the mutant options were considered with hundreds of, input, uh, of inputs, hundreds of dimensions as an input to the DNN? I suspect the hyperparameter optimization will be an issue. Always hyperparameter optimization can be an issue with uh, these kind of techniques. And also, um, as part of the input, the PV distributions were used. So the question is whether we can do without them to reduce the complexity of the deep neural net. Finally, Chechev, as we've seen, is simple technique. It uh, gives you high accuracy when it's implemented appropriately. Um, it has low computational cost, again, when it's appro uh, appropriately implemented, only 10 to the 4 in the test that we carried out. Uh, handles high dimensionality in the way that I explained with the composition technique. And gives very encouraging results. I would say, out of what I've seen so far, the best technique out there when you put things on a balance in terms of simplicity, cost, and so on. But of course, in particular for dynamic initial margin, we would like to extend the tests to cover different kind of products and with different kind of uh, risk factor evolution models. And to finally wrap up the presentation, what are the key takeaways? So we identified at the beginning pricing problem and risk calculations. We all know about it. Calling pricing routines over and over can be expensive. In particular, for dynamic initial margin, hugely expensive if you want to do it brute force. Regressions have been used uh, already for a couple of years in order to address this computational cost, even more than two years. They're simple, but lack accuracy, especially when you're trying to simulate sim deep neural nets. More recently uh, proposed is a writing technique, of course, not just for these kind of calculations, for other stuff. Uh, but the question is, what would happen if we uh, introduce more complex things like the mutant options when you have 600 inputs or so? Uh, then chip chip tensors are very powerful, as we saw, because they've got a very solid mathematical framework. And uh, they can accurately compute risk metrics, such as DIM, in a very cheap way compared to brute force. And I would say, overall, for me, this is the technique 
that uh, shines the most when you compare it to the other ones. But still, we need to um, research, of course, as always, continues in for every of these techniques. And we'll see uh, what's there to come. But a lot of promising stuff in the pipeline. Uh, well, thank you very, very much for um, being with us. And please um, get in contact with us if you've got any questions. Here are contact details. Uh, these are the references that I said we had. Get in contact with us if you have, uh, if you want more of those or any questions. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario. We've got in the chat for you. So if you just want to tab across to that and have a look. thing to I'm in presentation mode so I need to so maybe you can read me the question sorry because I can't sure. so when you compute the sensitivity in each Chebyshev point of tensor how do you compute that sensitivity oh so it goes back to um, yeah that is the it's definitely conceptually the, the hardest part for sure. And it's basically summarized in this, um, this slide, let me see. If I... In this slide, basically. So if you want to compute the sensitivity on this, on each Chebyshev point, you've got the Chebyshev point here and you want to compute the sensitivity, you have to take the composition of these two functions, SI and H. H is the embedding, which is difficult to compute, but SI, it's a function that you can come up with. Either you already have it because this is the way that you can do sensitivities or you use bump and reval from your original pricing functions. It depends on what you have at your disposal in order to compute sensitivities. I use the pricing function, use bump, bump and reval at each of those points and that gave me the value. Excellent, thank you. Okay, and another one. What happens if you use other family of polynomials like legendary polynomials. Yeah, so good question. There are other families of polynomials that also have good convergence properties. And they, in a very similar manner to Chebyshev points, you also need to uh, sample them smartly, as we said. I stick to Chebyshev, or we stick to Chebyshev tensors simply because in, I would say, in almost every front, they're the simplest uh, collection of polynomials that you can consider. When you uh, have to build a tensor, only specifying the Chebyshev points and evaluating the function on those points will give you an expression, but then you can start evaluating very simply with barycentric interpolation formula. You change families of polynomials, you can still get good mathematical properties, but you then complicate the formulas and it becomes, and you need to take extra steps and so on. In these kind of exercises, when you have to go into existing engines, you have to incorporate new methodologies on top of things, the simpler, the better, in my opinion. This is by far that I know of the simplest approach using these kind of polynomials. Okay, sounds like a great summary. So with that having been said, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you again, Mariana, for taking the time out to deliver that today. Um, we don't have any more webinars that will be delivered. So please keep an eye out in your newsletters, emails, and also on the websites for notifications of what we'll be doing in 2020. Once again, Mariano, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending. Well, thank, thank you very much for having us here. And thank you everyone for coming here. Thanks. Take care.